Well, thank you for that kind introduction and for the honor of being here. It truly is a pleasure. And uh, I've been trying all my life to be less disruptive, uh, but I'll try to put the creative part in this, uh, is to the extent that it's appropriate here. So the title I was given was State of the Science of Energy Balance Research Across the Lifespan. Um, I'm not really sure how much I'm going to address the across the lifespan part, but I'm going to try to talk about two big topics within this that hopefully will really just set the stage for some of the other good work you're going to hear today and the next few days. Uh, this is all pretty much straightforward. The, probably the important thing here is my email address. Uh, feel free to email me if you want to follow up or if you want copies of the slides. So there are two main challenges that I'm going to address. I'm going to spend almost all my time on the first one and then I'm just going to dip my toe in the water on the second one which I think will be a setup for uh, the next speaker. The first one has to do with measurement. Now I think you're going to hear from many people about measurement during the course of this conference and you're going to hear some interesting and exciting alternative approaches to measurements that rely in part on new technology and I think that that's good. What my talk will probably be about is perhaps why it's so vital and why we really need to invest in that and I'm going to try, I guess, to be a little disruptive in a sense and try to, I don't want to say create a crisis because I don't think that that's an apt description, but to get you to believe that, that we are at a crisis point, that we've actually been at one for a long time and just have not been willing to admit it with regards to measurement of energy intake and possibly other aspects of diet. There is considerable evidence to indicate that most of the commonly used methods for large-scale studies, which are based on self-report, are markedly limited. That's what I'm going to talk about here. Some investigators have opined that such methods are of such poor quality that they do not, being, they do not merit being used at all. And yet, equally well-informed people have opined that, well, they're imperfect, but they're still the best things we have, and we ought to use them. So how do equally intelligent, informed, educated people come to such different conclusions? And I'll try to address that a little bit. The second, which as I say, I'll just dip my toe in the water on, is that the lack of a strong theory to reliably predict the extent to which energy compensation will occur in response to any perturbation of one component of energy balance, I think is a major challenge that faces us. I don't know if it's quite as easily surmountable. This may seem like a big challenge. I think this is actually a much bigger one. Uh, the absence of such a theory makes it difficult to generalize beyond any one setting or experiment with, anyone, with any confidence. So we can do an ex experiment in one setting. We can say under these circumstances, this is the kind of effect we get on energy balance. And then we're not clear. Will that hold up with younger people, older people, men, women? If I do it in the cold, if I do it in a warm environment, if I change the diet composition, if I change whether I give the food at day or night? The answer is we don't know. We don't know because we don't have a robust theory that allows us to determine that. All right, so let's get into measurement. So some of you who know me know I like to go hiking a lot. This is a picture from Oak Mountain State Park, which is near where I live. And hiking with a statistician is perhaps a, a slightly unusual activity. And I was hiking with my kids and some postdocs not too uh, long ago, and we came across this rock and this sign. And it says, 346-ton boulder slid 250 feet on April 10, 2014. And so my kids kind of get used to this. And I turn to them and I say, how do you know? They said, what? I said, how do you know? They said, what do you mean? I said, how do you know it's 346 tons? They said, how does the sign says? I said, well, how do you think they figured out? You think they brought a scale in here and picked the thing up and weighed it? They said, well, I guess not. Probably not how it works. And I said, well, how would you figure out the weight? So they started thinking about different things. So I said, well, get a picture. My daughter took the picture. And then I emailed the guys at the park, emailed the rangers, and I said, how do you know? <laughs> so, uh, Allison again. No. They, they were very nice, and a few emails went around, and they said, here's the young guy who did it. And he said, oh, well, I work with the parks, and my brother is a geology engineer. So I got a little piece of the rock, and I sent it to my brother, and he told me the density of the rock. So that's a good start. Okay. So then I took the length, the height, and the width, and I multiplied, and I got the area, and area density. I got the mass. And I thought, length, height, width, this is not a rectangular prism. So how would you do that? So I'm going to see if I can get some engineering students to come out and really take pictures of this thing right. 
and see if we can figure out what the real mass is. But that kind of questioning, I think, is what we always need to do. It's sort of part and parcel, I think, of being a, a good scientist is always asking, how do you know? Where did that data come from? And that's measurement. All right. When it comes to food, how do you know? So when people say the average woman eats, you know, 1,800 calories a day or 1,500 calories a day or whatever it says in some survey, how do you know? And this is one Denny Beer shared with me years ago. And this is from a New York Times article. It says, Southwest Airlines doesn't offer food, but in surveys it is consistently related to, rated as serving good meals. So people don't even remember whether they ate, let alone what they ate. And this, I think, tells us some of the challenges we have with dietary intake. Now, people, as I say, offer differing opinions. And I take as granted that the people writing these papers are intelligent, they are informed, they are honest, and they're thoughtful. So it's interesting when we get to very different conclusions. So Nikhil Durander, myself, and a whole slew of others, there's about 40 of us who are part of this group that signed off, wrote a paper and we said energy balance measurement when something is not better than nothing. And this is to address what I see as the, the most common argument in favor of using self-reported dietary energy intake. People will say, we admit it's not perfect, but it is the best we have available. Now I'd like to ask you this. Suppose that I tell you I have a shuttle. The shuttle will take you to Mars. It is the best available shuttle there is. However, I have to be honest, it blows up 95% of the time. <laughs> Might you say, I accept that it's the best there is. I accept that there's a lot I could learn by going to Mars, and I really would like to go, and it seems very important. But maybe I'm just not ready to go to Mars if it blows up 95% of the time. And I think that's kind of where we are with this thing. Just because it's the best there is, does not in and of itself imply it's worth using. Something can be the best there is and still not be worth using. Now here you get a different point of view here from Amy Subar and a very esteemed group of colleagues. And they wrote in summarizing things, they defended dietary data a little bit. Note, by the way, an important thing. We're talking only about energy intake here. They're talking about dietary data in general. They do make a couple of points. The first actually agrees with us. They say, do not use self-reported energy intake as a measure of true energy intake. So we agree on this point. Even what I would consider, not the most staunch defenders, but probably the most staunch, educated, thoughtful defenders of this, even they have said, when it comes to energy intake per se, self-report is simply inadequate. It shouldn't be used. Do use self-reported energy intake for energy adjustment or other self-reported dietary of other self-reported dietary constituents whoops, to improve risk estimation studies of diet health associations. So they see some role for it in energy adjustment, but not use in and of itself. All right, so a couple of differences there. One of the things I also want to point out is this is not a new issue. So if somebody thinks that in 2014 we suddenly realized this problem, no. This is 10 years earlier, 2005 from uh, J.T. Winkler, who I don't believe I know, but who wrote about the fundamental flaw in obesity research. He said the basic problem with comparative diet trials is our inability to measure what people eat. Developing rigorous measures of food intake is the highest priority in obesity research. So that's 10 years ago. You can find statements about concerns about self-reported dietary intake and our difficulty in measuring dietary intake going back decades before that. I also want to make a point about the scope of generalization. Generalization is always tricky. You know, if I show you a machine that flips coins with great precision and say, this is the probability of a head coming up, and you think, well, this is a simple, well-controlled thing, I cannot guarantee you absolutely a priori that that will be the same if I do it at a higher altitude or a lower altitude, if I do it in a room where the doors open and some wind could occur, if I do it under one circumstance or another circumstance. But that's a pretty simple machine, and you might say, I'm, I'm willing to generalize, I'm willing to accept that I'll get about the same rate of heads under most circumstances. As we get into more and more complicated situations, our ability to generalize becomes a matter of judgment. And the question is, what do we want to generalize across? So as with anything, there are different degrees of staunchness and opinions. 
there have been some people who have come out and said all dietary data is so bad that none of it merits being used ever. It is simply unacceptable for use in science. I am not one of those people. I have carefully limited my own comments to self-reports of energy intake, not all dietary intake. And here's why I think that. I believe that a priori, general conclusions as opposed to speculations, right? I can speculate. I might have a gut instinct about how good certain aspects of dietary intake are or not. But in terms of actually drawing a scientific conclusion about the validity or lack thereof of any particular aspect of dietary energy intake, I can't generalize or I'm not willing to generalize to all aspects of dietary intake and don't think we should as a field because such conclusions are derived from empirical evidence. That is, there's no a priori logical or mathematical proof that self-reported uh, dietary intake is or is not good or bad. It's an empirical question. And if it's an empirical question, I've got to look at the data for different aspects of intake. And those data may arguably be different. So just think about, here's just seven arbitrary things I wrote down of things you might be interested in studying. You might be interested in studying energy intake. You might be interested in another study in studying macronutrient intake. You might be interested in whether or not people eat kosher. You might be interested in whether they ever eat mushrooms. You might be interested in how often they eat food grown in their own garden. You might be interested in their consumption of hot sauces or whether they consume raw oysters. Those are seven very different things. And it's arguable that some of them might be reported with very low fidelity energy intake. I think we have good data on that. And some, perhaps, I'm just going to guess, consuming raw oysters. People know if they're regular consumers of raw oysters or not, and they will honestly report it. I don't know if that's true. I'm speculating. But that might be the case. And so I don't think we can make a blanket recommendation that all self-report measurements in general or about food intake are not fit for scientific use. The crux of the argument on the value of self-report energy intake per se really comes down to this. Everybody agrees it's flawed, and everybody agrees that they're the most usable on large-scale basis. No disagreement there. Where we disagree is whether or not the flaws are so big that they should be abandoned entirely. I'm one of the people that believes the flaws are so bad that you sh just should not use it. It is better to not do a study of energy intake than to do one based upon self-report. And here are some quotations indicating that. Here's from Ford and Dietz, and this is sort of got how I got started in recent years of getting into it. I was actually involved in this many years ago, but came back recent years. When this paper came out, and some colleagues and I, actually there was one before this, but this one in particular caught our attention. It's coming from the CDC. And the author said, an important limitation of this study is the reliance on self-reported energy intakes. So here they're saying it's a limitation. It's not an invalidating aspect. It's a limitation, but it was still worth doing the paper. And it's odd because Bill Dietz was actually an author of a paper 25 years earlier in which he had looked at doubly labeled water data and said, people shouldn't use self-reported energy intake in obesity research anymore. He said, how are you, you know, why 30 years is something different? And so Dale Scholler, who, Scheller, who's originally his author on that 30-year-old paper, we came back and we wrote this letter and we said, simply self-report based estimates of energy intake offer an in inadequate basis for scientific conclusions. So those are the two competing views, limited versus not worth using. I want to offer the following proposition. Self-reported energy intake are of insufficient quality to merit use in scientific research about ac actual energy intake. Abandoning self-reported energy intake will lead to fewer misleading paths in the field. And abandoning self-reported energy intake will catalyze major new efforts to develop worthy methods. And so that really leads us to where we're going to hopefully get in this tech summit today, next few days. Now the first problem, there are three major problems I'm going to point out with self-reported energy intake. The first one I'm going to call the easy problem, and it's underestimation. This is the one that's often talked about the most because it's the easiest to understand, and it makes for dramatic headlines, and you can say things like, look, people were off by hundreds and hundreds of calories. And you can see all these different studies that Dale Scheller uh, compiled over 15 years ago, but they uh, look at you know these different magnitudes of underestimation, and sometimes it's more than a half, right? So people report less than half their total food intake, total energy intake in some studies. So these studies, this method is clearly way low. And I say this is the easy problem because if you just tell me that 
these things always underestimate by half. I can fix that. I just multiply by two, right? If you tell me everybody's down by 100 calories, I just add 100. No problem. So this is really actually not that big a deal, as long as we don't take seriously the numbers, as long as we inflate them back up. You still see sometimes you hear people saying, the average woman eats 1,500 calories and the average man eats 2,000 based upon self-report. As long as we, we just adjust them up, that's easy. Here's the problem I'm going to say is the difficult problem, number two. It's low validity. It's low correlation between the measured values and the true values. That's much more challenging. And I think some of the best evidence for this, although again, it goes back for decades, best recent evidence comes from this paper in 2014. And I wrote a, uh, an F1000 entry on it. And in my F1000 entry, just summarizing, I said across both sexes and different self-report approaches, the squared correlation coefficients for reported versus true energy intakes never exceeded 0.1. In other words, 10% of the variance share. In other words, self-report based estimates of energy intake never explain more than 10% of the variance in true energy intake. So this is really, really low. And that's sort of the big concern, or a big concern. This is a very difficult problem. Now that alone would not be insurmountable. In theory, as a statistician, we can always fix random measurement error through a combination of increasing the sample size, increasing the number of measurements, and then some statistical fix-ups. I say in theory because sometimes it doesn't always work out so well, but in theory we can do that, right? As long We can have bad data. As long as we know the way in which it's bad, we can fix it. We can make it back to where it should be. Now this is the problem that I think is the worst of all. And this is what I'm going to call the nearly intractable problem. And it is that these errors are large. I've already shown you that. But they are large and they are correlated. And they are correlated in complex ways with other factors, right? So if all the error was truly random, it's unrelated to anything else we were ever going to study, it was ever related to what we're studying, would it be that big a deal again to put some statistical fix-ups in, me measurement error corrections? But because the errors are correlated, that is, some people underreport or overreport more than others. Now, unless we know the exact pattern of that error, and we don't, it's hard, if not impossible, to correct. And it create, can create biases in any number of directions. And this is, I think, the real problem, a really big problem. So I'm going to give some support for these propositions. First is support uh, for the general proposition that abandoning self-reported energy intake will lead to less misleading paths in the field. This is an old slide I made when I was a postdoc, and it, it holds up today. And so uh, this is sort of a crude meta-analysis, and I got at the time some studies that uh, reported the association between uh, BMI and energy intake by self-report. And what you see is there is a negative correlation. In other words, people with higher BMIs report eating less total energy. It is consistently negative. It tends to be around negative 0.16. It is highly homogeneous. It is highly statistically significant. So it's repeatable, dependable, statistically significant, negative correlation. Now, that led people to publish conclusions like this. A collection of literature suggests that on average, fat people do not eat more than normal individuals. And they cite some papers. So this led to conclusions. Now, again, these are old data, but the results are the same today. Here's the little meta-analysis. Now we have energy intake and BMI with actual energy intake via doubly abled water. And now the correlations are not negative. They are positive. They average a little more than 0.5. They are, again, highly homogeneous. So they are reproducible, they are consistent, they are statistically significant, and they are in the complete opposite direction. So the idea that, well, self-report, it's not perfect, but at least it gives us some approximate estimation, no. It gives us the exactly <laughs> wrong answer in this particular context. It doesn't give you close to the right answer. It doesn't at least help you advance knowledge a little, if imperfectly. It completely leads you astray. This phenomena persists in recent times and in longitudinal models. So here's just, I wanted to just show you a recent paper that did it, and the title says it all. Elevated, objectively measured, but not self-reported energy intake predicts future weight gain in adolescence. So again, you get a different answer 
depending upon whether you use self-report or measurement. Now, some people have said, well, yes, there's measurement error, but such misclassification was likely non-differential, as is a typical thing said at the end of epidemiologic papers in nutrition. Yes, my measurement is imperfect, but, you know, it's sort of non-differential, and it probably just biases us toward the null. To which we say, oh, really? <laughs> now, this is from a paper by some eminent statisticians who work in this field, including very bright man named Lawrence Friedman. Now, he's not writing about energy intake here. I want to be clear and honest about that. Um, they're talking about primarily about dietary fat. They phrase their thing about diet in general. Say, we emphasize the importance of the role played by measurement error from assessing dietary habits using self-reported questionnaires as it can distort estimated associations, not necessarily toward the absence of association. So in this paper in... 2009, Friedman and colleagues say, this is not just going to make associations null, it can make associations positive. And that's supported by these simulation studies from Fuel et al., in which they've taken correlation patterns similar to the ones that exist in nutrition epidemiology, and said, if I were controlling for a covariate, like energy intake, using it as an adjustment factor in a model, but it's measured imperfectly, could that lead to residual confounding, meaning the confounder is still there? Think about taking this to the extreme. You say it's very important in your model, testing the relationship between x and y, that you control for z. You say, I agree. And my measurement of z is that I turn on a computer and I ask it to generate a random number called z prime. It has nothing to do with anything, it's random. And I use that. It's like z is too expensive for me to measure. I'm just going to measure z prime, which is a pure random number. And you'd say, huh? Aren't you just controlling for, in essence, nothing? And won't the confounding still be there? Yes, that is true. Why would you think that's relevant? Well, that's the limit of having a measure with no validity. Right? So as the measure becomes less and less valid, you're getting close to that point of controlling for just a random variable. And they show here that that could create this residual confounding. Now, this has had different groups of uh, people uh, have different opinions about this. So we wrote in response to a paper by Subar et al., in which they were responding to some of the other statements in the field. We wrote, first, there's clear empirical evidence that residual confounding can indeed create the kind of associations typically observed in nutrition epidemiology studies. We said, hey, this can create associations, not just lead to biases toward the null. They responded and said the evidence to date indicates that attenuation, that is reducing effects or associations, is much more serious problem than residual confounding. They say, you know, given the patterns of association, residual confounding is probably not going to be there. I don't know if they're right or not. It's interesting that Lawrence Friedman, who I pointed out earlier, is also an author of this paper. So we've got different statements about residual confounding here. Now, this man is Daniel Kahneman, the Nobel Prize winning economist, and he has a neat little video you can watch on YouTube. There's a clip of it in which he talks about this idea of adversarial collaboration. And I think this is an opportunity, maybe you'll see or somebody can sponsor something on this, where you could say, okay, you guys have stated with relative degree of precision some differing views. One of them ought to be right. We ought to be able to figure this out. All right? If one of us says, you know, the square root of 2 is a rational number, and says, no, the square root of 2 is an irrational number. We're not going to just agree to disagree on this. When I say, I don't know, I think it's irrational, I think it's rational, let's just agree to disagree with different points of view. No, let's figure it out. There's a proof here. And so I think, let's get, this is not as simple as, is the square root of 2 an irrational number, but let's sort of sit down and say, why do you believe this? Can we come up with a circumstance in which this is right under these circumstances, this is right under these circumstances, to make that clear? So I think this may be a fun opportunity for an adversarial collaboration that perhaps LC or someone could catalyze. All right, so back to this question of how can intelligent people disagree? And I think this is the answer, because I think all of us, and I include myself in this, have in at least one respect not been very scientific about this. So imagine that people say it's well established that smaller, shorter children are at higher risk of injury when going on this particular carnival ride. And everybody agrees, just like everybody agrees 
dietary measurement by self-report is imperfect. And then somebody comes along and says, therefore, this kid is too short to ride. And someone else says, I don't think the kid is too short to ride, even though I recognize she's a little short, and that puts you at increased risk. Well, you'd have to say, well, where's the benchmark? What's too short? You've got to lay that out. So has anybody ever heard anybody in the nutrition field say, here are the rules for when a measurement is worth using. If the reliability exceeds this number, if the validity exceeds that number, et cetera, it's worth using. Otherwise, it's not. Now, it's not going to be that simple. You're going to have to ask use for what, use under which circumstances, and so forth. But maybe we can start to lay these things out. This is something I started to do at one point, haven't had time to follow through on. But you can start to see immediately, you say, well, I could always just, if I want to know how much somebody eats, I could just look at how big they are. And just from their body size, I could get an estimate. That's really cheap and easy. And I don't have to ask them. So is my measurement better than that? That would be a beginning point. If my measurement via self-report or anything else is not better than that, I might as well just guess based on their body size. So you could start to have a dialogue about this and think about the costs of measurement and so on. All right. So I think the tentative criteria for something being useworthy is that the measurement errors will be random and modest and therefore correctable with known measurement error correction procedures. What we see with self-reported energy intake is that's not true. Second is that obtained estimates will be in the correct direction. We've seen that that's not true in the area of, for example, the relation of BMI and energy intake. That errors will not lead to detection of false effects under plausibly common circumstances. And we've seen that that's not true. So lastly, I want to offer support basically by anecdote and analogy uh, for the proposition that abandoning self-reported energy intake will catalyze major new efforts to develop worthy methods. And I think the very fact that we're all here with so many technology interested people here as well is a testament to the beginning of this kind of thinking. This is a, a statue that's in a little town called Enterprise, Alabama. And this, this Greek woman is holding up uh, the bull weevil. So what happened in the, uh, at the time of George Washington Carver was the boll weevil came up through Alabama from the south and it started wiping out the cotton crop. And Enterprise Alabama made its living on cotton. And so they got the best scientist in Alabama at the time, which was George Washington Carver, to come on over and give them some advice. And Dr. Carver said, plant peanuts. He loved peanuts. And so they switched to peanuts. And in a year or so, had the biggest peanut crop in the nation. That was in 1913, I believe. And turned their entire economy around. And so they now, being in much better shape, you would have thought they built a statue to George Washington Carver. But they built one to the boll weevil because it was the boll weevil that forced them to abandon what was not as good a method. So sometimes you need something to come along to force you to abandon what you're comfortable with, even though it creates a bottleneck of discomfort for a while that leads to something better. We also see that when people then have that situation where they're highly motivated to try to pursue something new, look at how the prices have dropped per megabase of DNA sequencing because there was a need for it and the NIH and others created economies of scale. We have not created the need for an economy of scale for doubly labeled water and other technologies, and so they remain expensive and modestly accessible. But if everybody turned off the spigot suddenly on the use of self-report and said, it's done, sorry, not interested in your paper anymore, would people then suddenly say, holy cow, we got to bring the cost of this doubly labeled water down. Forget the arguments anymore about doubly labels too, too expensive. I've got to use self-report to measure energy intake. And so I just can't use self-report anymore. Maybe we would figure out how to bring these costs down. All right. I'm going to just touch on this briefly and basically say that when we, this is the second part about this mathematical theory that I think leads to the next speaker's talk that I'm very enthusiastic about hearing. And that is the idea that when we have a mathematical theory of things, we can often make precise predictions. We see it in astronomy, all these great historical examples of, of um, Ole Romer predicting when a moon would come around the planet, showing that the speed of light was finite. Um, all these great things when we have good theories, right? Moons 
are a lot easier to predict. You've got a lot fewer factors involved. You've got this known theory of gravity and so on. Those allow for precise mathematical predictions. In the area of energy balance, Diana Thomas, Kevin Hall, and others have done this. And they've given us some models. This is from one of Diana's papers in which she shows predicted weights and actual weights. These are predicted from her mathematical model in a particular weight loss study. And she shows the great precision of those estimates because she's got a good mathematical model. Now, when you go into the real world and behavior comes into play, we don't have a great mathematical model. So that now, this is from a paper we did supported by Ilse, when you say, okay, we're going to look at the prediction out of Diana Thomas's mathematical model, and then we're going to look at observed change when one aspect of energy balance was changed. For example, experimenters said, we want you to eat more calories, eat 200 grams of almonds every day, or something like this, and we'll see what happens to your weight. And we know that if there was no behavioral compensation, they would land on this line. And what we find is they land on this line. That is, they gain a lot less weight than we would expect. And when you make people engage in supervised exercise, they lose a little less weight than you'd expect. There, the compensation doesn't seem to be as great, which, by the way, is opposed to the common thing we hear about. The body defends against the downward drops in BMI very, or in weight very much, more so than it defends against the upward. I don't know. We're not seeing it in this particular data set, so I don't know if that's a folklore or what. But the point is, we don't have any theory that leads us to know what these slopes are. We just observe them. And I can't tell you why this thing is above the slope and that thing, or above the line, and that thing's below it. And so there, I think, if we had a theory, and I don't know how tractable that is, we could really make a lot more progress. Because otherwise, we're stuck being purely one-off empirical every time. Saying, in this case, I ran a study with people of this age, race, sex, under this circumstance, at this altitude, at this temperature, with this macronutrient composition, given on this kind of plate, at this kind of time, and I did or didn't observe, this change in energy balance. And I don't know if it will hold in that altitude on that kind of plate with that diet and so on and so on. So going forward, can we have a calculus of energy balance, including behavior? I don't know. Clark Hall, all the way back in the early part of the 20th century, tried to make mathematical models of behavior. And his colleagues laughed at him. And they would talk about his followers as being holier than thou. Uh, whether we are ready to be holier than thou now and return to the ideas of Clark Hall and have a mathematics of behavior or not, I don't know. And at this point, I'll simply say thank you. <laughs>